Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tim Gordon. I'm a marine biologist from the University of Exeter in the UK. And I'm part of a research group that studies the impact of climate change on our marine ecosystems. To do that, I spend extended periods of time in the world's most beautiful, most valuable, and most vulnerable corners of the oceans. Today, I'd like to share experiences with you from those places where climate change is hitting the hardest. And I'd like to discuss ideas from science that perhaps point a way to the future. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be sharing that with you. And so I'd like to thank very much the World Ocean Summit for inviting me to speak, the Pew Trust for funding me to be here, and all of you for coming to listen. Last summer, I accepted a position as the onboard field scientist on a research trip to the middle of the Arctic Ocean by sailing yacht. People said it was crazy. They laughed at us. They said, you can't drive a yacht through pack ice. You'll be back within a week feeling stupid and having gotten nowhere. They should have been right. And 20 years ago, they would have been right. But the Arctic Ocean is a very different place today. We left harbor in Alaska, and there was no ice. We sailed north, and after about three days, we left the coast of North America behind us. Still, no ice. After a week, we crossed into the international waters that make up the center of the Arctic Ocean. Still no ice. A week after that, we crossed the line on the map that said permanent extent of summer sea ice. According to the map, we weren't even on the blue anymore. Our little boat icon was high and dry on the white stuff. But looking around us, still no ice. In the end, we got further into the Arctic Ocean than any other sailing boat has in history. And we didn't even really have to try. It was the most depressingly easy journey I've ever been on. And that's because since the 1980s, on average, we've seen in the Arctic Ocean that summer extent of sea ice cover has gone down by 100,000 square kilometers every year. The Arctic Ocean is no longer the frozen north. It has changed beyond all recognition. At the other end of the spectrum, I also study the impact of climate-related coral bleaching on the northern Great Barrier Reef. Now, growing up as a kid with National Geographic posters on the bedroom wall and David Attenborough on the TV taught me that coral reefs should be an assault on the senses, a dazzling kaleidoscope of color, a symphony of sound as fish whoop and chirp and grunt and there's shrimp snapping their claws in every direction that you swim, the underwater city. But snorkeling over sections of the Barrier Reef a few months ago, it is a ghost of its former self. The underwater city is a rubble field, choked by a blanket of algae. The symphony of the sea has been silenced. In the global bleaching event of 2016, one third of all of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef were killed in three weeks. You see, wherever we go, we find marine ecosystems that are already dramatically degraded. And to be honest, it makes you question yourself. As a scientist, you ask, why do we bother? Why do we go to all of these places, take all of these measurements, carry out all of these surveys, when we know that the results are going to reduce us to tears every time? And it's because we believe things that things can be better. I'd like to suggest today three plausible, tangible things that we could do that future generations, I hope, will look back and say, thank goodness they did that in 2018. Didn't that make a real difference? The first of those is we need to embrace novelty. Climate change has left us with ecosystems that are already dramatically altered, but it hasn't left us with nothing. Too often we talk about degradation like it's this simple, binary, black and white process, as if climate change comes along and just rubs entire ecosystems off the map and leaves nothing behind. But that isn't the case. Science is teaching us more and more that there is subtlety and nuance involved in the changes that we're seeing, and that that is important. For instance, up in the Arctic, less ice means more light penetration, and we're seeing higher levels of photosynthesis from big algal blooms than we ever have before. This unprecedented primary productivity means that fish and mollusk and crab species that were previously only ever found in the Pacific Ocean are migrating upwards through the Bering Strait and into the Arctic for the first time. They're being followed by fishing birds and whales that, again, we've never seen there before. There's essentially a new normal in the Arctic. The same sort of thing is going on in the Atlantic Ocean. And a study by members of my research group showed that in Europe, the catches in our fisheries are reflective of that. 
What we used to pull up in our nets is no longer there. It's gone north, whereas it's been replaced by a new set of species that have been come up from the tropics. Understanding changes like that is really important because it fundamentally changes how we manage our ecosystems. For instance, there's no point taking heat-sensitive, fragile, unmodified corals and growing them up in a lab and then replanting them in areas of ocean that have been damaged by bleaching because the sea has already warmed up. If they died before, they will die again. There's no point making fishing quotas and targets for species that were traditionally in our waters, but they've now left because they're not there anymore. Instead of trying to preserve a picture of what our oceans used to look like, we need to think more intelligently about the future. We need to work out what species configurations are actually possible under today's and future climate scenarios. We need to calculate what value those novel ecosystems can realistically give to coastal communities of people. And then we need to work with those societies to adapt to the changing world around them. Can we develop alternate livelihoods for those who have lost? And where there are new opportunities to be gained, can we make sure that they are managed sustainably and profitably? What we've lost is sad, I'm not denying that. But if we fixate on yesterday's failures, we will only fail again tomorrow. Instead, we need to embrace novelty. The second thing we need to do is think big. Traditionally, the, the problems facing our oceans have been relatively local in scale. Overfishing, pollution, urbanization, tourism. And as a result, we've got pretty good at dealing with problems like that. But climate change is a new ball game. It's completely global, and it's very long term. That's maybe why we struggle with it a bit, and it means we need different types of solutions. Now, local management is still very useful because threats build on each other, and anything we can do to reduce local stresses will help in the fight against global threats. But at some level, it's inevitable that a big problem needs a big solution. Now, we've made really encouraging progress in getting solutions that are big on a spatial scale, international cooperation like the Paris Agreement, like the Arctic Moratorium on Fishing that came out recently. But what about timescales? Too often we see that political instability leads to environmental instability. The USA gets a new president, leaves the Paris Agreement, and that's thrown into doubt. Britain leaves the European Union, and the way the common fisheries policy works starts to have a bit of a wobble. Transboundary agreements in Southeast Asia break down, and it's the fish stocks in the South China Sea that suffer. You see, whatever you think of any of those individual political decisions, you have to agree that environmental sustainability requires solutions that are going to be stable long-term, that can't be undermined by politics that change every few years. A big challenge for us is to maintain sustainability irrespective of sovereignty. We've got good spatial solutions. We've got good spatial solutions. Now, can we find a way of future-proofing them? As well as our solutions transcending national boundaries, they need to transcend generations. We need to think big. And finally, and most importantly, we need to show the world that it's worth it. There's nothing more powerful than public opinion. And so, as a priority, we need to get 7.5 billion people on side. I'd suggest the best way to do that is to celebrate our successes. People love backing a winner. And whilst it's true that we have to be serious about the scale of the problem, it is also true that traditional doom and gloom narratives that shroud climate change stories just pose a real threat of making the problem worse. They engender feelings of hopelessness, and that leads to apathy and inaction. We have made great progress. We're just not very good at shouting about it. For instance, between 2013 and 2016, global carbon emissions flattened, despite continued economic growth. Now, emissions are sadly back on the rise again now, but for a minute there, there was a really important proof of concept, that decoupling of emissions and economic growth. But I don't think anybody really heard about it. Two days ago, a study was published that showed that in my home country, in the UK, our emissions in 2017 were lower than they have been for any of the previous 120 years. And yet, on my BBC News app yesterday morning, it didn't even make the home page. We're missing tricks. It's no wonder people are disillusioned. There's loads of other reasons for optimism as well. Thermal refugia are naturally cooler spots in the ocean that provide some level of protection against warming, as Professor Herr Goldberg was talking about yesterday, two days ago, sorry. There's natural resistance. Corals in the Persian Gulf 
can withstand temperatures that are four degrees higher than those on the Great Barrier Reef before they start to bleach. And there's new ideas and emerging technologies all of the time, strides forward in renewable energy, in carbon capture, in genetic manipulations, in our ability to move whole ecosystems around the world, and all sorts of ideas that we've heard over the last three days. But more importantly than all, we need to remind people that the ocean is still full of wonders. None of us in this room will ever again see an Arctic Ocean covered in summer ice. None of us in this room will ever again see the Great Barrier Reef in its former glory. But that is not a reason to give up. The ocean is still full of an astonishing diversity of life, and it still provides the livelihoods for hundreds of millions of people. And that is crucial. You see, positivity behind that sort of message was recently behind the biggest social movement for change that we've seen in the UK for years. The BBC's Blue Planet 2 television documentary showed in six brilliant, technicolor, award-winning episodes just how astonishingly amazing marine life is. People loved it. And then, it, when it showed in its seventh episode, when it talked about the problem of marine plastic, there was public outcry. From a nation that was previously pretty apathetic to that sort of thing, there was a change in opinion overnight. Our politicians were talking about being haunted by plastic, declaring war on plastic. Our supermarkets and pub chains are now competing with each other to slash their plastic use. You can't go on Facebook anymore without being hit by a surge of requests for your signature on the latest online petition against ocean waste. It's brilliant. It's transformed. And it is because Blue Planet 2 won a nation's hearts. By inspiring people about the jaw-dropping riches of the ocean's life, you give them a reason to fight for it. By being positive, you transform ocean conservation from being a depressing burden to bear to being a passionate cause. And history tells us that there is nothing more dangerously powerful than a crowd with a cause. We need to show people it's worth it. Thank you again for listening to the thoughts of a young marine biologist about the ecosystems that I work in. Our oceans today have already changed beyond recognition. But if we can embrace novelty, think big, and show the world that it's worth it, we can still protect an astonishing diversity of life and all that it provides. So let's not cry about what we've lost. Let's celebrate and protect what still remains. Thank you. Yes.